All right, so we are live tonight. I'm with Tara. Uh, is it Tara? I saw your email is Tara Chapman. Is that? <laughs> That's okay. right. Tara Chapman from Two Hives. Uh, would you like to give a little background on who you are and what you've done in, with your beekeeping? Yeah, so uh, I own a company called Two Hives Honey in Austin, Texas. We're just east of Austin, actually. I've had Two Hives for about 10 years. I'm sure we'll probably get into what I did before. Yeah. Um, but we are honey producers, very small honey producers, but all of our hives are within 20 miles of downtown Austin. So we don't pack honey. Everything that we sell is our own. Um, but kind of our big specialty where we really excel is our agritourism. So we do education tours, experiences, honey tastings, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, I figured I might as well get right into it. Uh, so how did you get started in beekeeping? Yeah, so my journey is a little bit uh, of a unique one. Um, I am from Texas originally. I uh, grew up in a tiny little town in West Texas and went to school on the East Coast. I went to Duke. And then I was recruited to work uh, in intelligence for the federal government just out of college. So I spent 10 years working in various facets with the federal government. Um, but most of that time was spent examining issues or working on matters in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq. So Middle East, but mostly Southwest Asia. Um, and uh, I, I was rounding out about a decade of doing that. And I, at the time I was splitting my time between, uh, I was working part-time from Austin and so I was splitting my time between Austin, D.C., and Afghanistan. And um, very different wardrobes, those three job <laughs> locations. And yeah. uh, had taken a beekeeping class just mostly on like a whim, like didn't know that was yeah. something people did, you know, <laughs> and fell in love with it. It was looking for an exit strategy and was really fascinated that um, the different honeys throughout the year from my hives tasted totally different. I didn't know that was a thing. And so I had this idea for a, a kind of micro hyper local honey company and then quit my job within six or seven months. Went and worked for a bee breeder in East Texas and the rest is history. So you, so you have, you built a honey ranch. What was that three years ago? Yes. So it'll be three years in August. Yeah. So before that we had, so the, I, the business has been around, we're going on eight years um, and we had a little shop in Austin. So our hives were kind of scattered at different locations. We were doing yeah. hive tours at a cidery. Um, <laughs> uh, and then before that we were doing hive tours at a farm. So we didn't actually own any of our own land. And had a little shop in Austin where we would just sell equipment and we would do classes and things like that. Didn't have bees there. And then during, I, I would actually, I'd been looking, we outgrew that space very quickly. And so was looking for a new space, looked for almost a year. Commercial real estate is challenging, particularly in Austin. Found a space, was in the final throes of negotiating that space. And that's when the pandemic happen shut down happen and thank goodness we hadn't signed that lease because we i don't know where we would be now and and then during the you know very quickly so we lost our lease my boyfriend at the time my now husband we had you know an offer on a house that didn't come through just everything sort of was crumbling um because of the financial fallout of the uh shutdown and then we decided to buy this space so we bought in july august of 2020 yeah, yeah 2020 yeah. <laughs> um yeah it's about three years ago and it's, it was such a great such a great move unfortunate that you know we had to go through the pandemic to like make me realize what we really <laughs> should be doing yeah. um but what a great you know pivot i'm sure everyone's annoyed with that word at this point but like what a great pivot for us it's been great it just allows us to really excel and add rocket fuel to our agritourism. Like we've just become this awesome little destination. It's really fun. How do, so how many hives do you guys run like normally? Um, 
uh 250 300 you know how it goes like from any one given day to another you're like i don't know how many today i actually haven't even counted in the last six months but i think that's usually the number we share is 250 300 so big of the smalls you know what i mean very small but like when you look at small beekeepers or the bigs of the smalls is what i like to say (laughs) yeah it it's um the markets are different everywhere like here you'd only need like 150 at maximum like 250 colonies to make a living because there's infinite amounts of beekeepers to sell equipment to and infinite amounts of tourists to sell honey to Mm -hmm. so but technically like the technical definition for sideline to commercial Mm -hmm. beekeepers like 150 to 350 hives which i always I, i learned that recently and i find that well it's just it depends on where you are, I guess. So 150 to 350 is technically a sideliner, right? That's yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, that jives. But, um, yeah, you know, it's funny when in in beekeeping, everyone does a little bit of everything to kind of yeah. make it work. The challenge that we have is that, I mean, I bet your nectar flows are way better than our nectar flows. Like you would expect that they would just be, I, I don't know. I, I know that there's a large parts of the northern part of the United States that Nectar flows are shorter, but just so much stronger. Central Texas is not, it's not the worst (laughs) place to make honey, but it's certainly far from the best. We have this weird dynamic where you, we don't have cold enough winters that our bees stay clustered all winter, but they're not warm enough that they have forage throughout the winter. And so they spend a lot of the winter months foraging for food. (laughs) that doesn't exist. And so they, yeah. they just consume through so much, you know? Yeah. Costs on the feed bill, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're like not warm enough. Like Southern California would be where they get, you know, nectar. I mean, probably just about year round. Anyway, we're in this kind of weird in between space in central Texas, East yeah. of us. It's a little bit better. East, east of you, there's more of a winter, right? Uh, uh, no, east oh, of west us. Of west of us is more of a winter. Yeah, okay. east of us is a stronger nectar flow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like if you had a strong hive and you don't have any drawn comb and you put it on there, what, what, how much honey do you think they would make in that uh, first spring if you didn't, you know, um, if you didn't have any drawn comb? Just so, out of curiosity. So we, we get two nectar flows in a given year. So I want all of my hives to be producing. And when I say producing, I mean making enough for me to pull at least 60 pounds of honey. And in the grand scheme of things, like that's just not that much for a lot of these big honey producing areas. (laughs) Yeah. Not any, anywhere near, you know, we certainly have above that and have below that, but like, I want to get at least 60 pounds off of a colony. Uh, but with, um, you know, going back to this notion that so many beekeepers do a little bit of everything. Um, yeah. and, and we do that too. Um, but we originally started the agritourism piece to make up for the fact that we're just be, yeah. both because of where we are, the number of colonies we run our practices, we're never going to be big honey producers. Uh, and so that pays the bills when that can't. And also it sells our honey that, that yeah. exit through yeah, the gift sense. shop yeah. phenomenon is <laughs> powerful. <laughs> you know, in fact, we cut our wholesale program the last two years because um, we've had two of the, we've had the last two harvests, two years have been the worst since I started keeping bees a decade ago. It's been awful. And so we cut our wholesale program because we couldn't really yeah. afford those mark to lose those margins. Um, but we can only do that because again, we've got, I mean, tomorrow we'll have 60 tomorrow's a big day we'll probably have 80 plus people on site between 11 a.m and 3 p.m and they'll all (laughs) exit through the gift shop (laughs) yeah that's uh that's a lot of people i mean during during the summer we'll get massive amounts of traffic like that um when everybody's escaping the south because like even like, so our hottest, like on average, I looked it up, our hottest day of the year is like July 21st, I think. Uh-huh. Um, and average temperature is like 85 degrees, I think it was. That's awesome. Uh, so even, I mean, we'll get, we'll get some summers where we have a week in the 90s. Sure. But the vast majority of the time, it's only in the 80s during the summer. It can be very humid, but. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> what's today, March 24th? It was 80 today in Texas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
we don't we don't get 80 still at least june if not yeah. july yeah <laughs> yeah it's and going back to what you said about the nectar flows it, it, i was talking to i think this was two live chats ago um during the south like generally the nectar flows are longer but they also you know since you're farther south um we get longer days during the summer like if you go to the up like up into the great plains they get really long days like so many hours of sunlight and i don't think it's as extreme where i live in maine but i would say that's true like we get you know in a good year maybe six to eight weeks of flow and but the bees can forage from like i don't know 7 a.m 6 a.m till there's normally foraging till around six o'clock mm -hmm. so like it's a really long time period and as far as what you're saying about honey production being better up here uh, I'm not in a particularly lucrative area, though I can't really say for sure because I haven't, you know, it's only my sixth year. And 2019 was like one of the best years on record in Maine. But that spring I had, uh, that was the spring after I started. So I had one colony and I split it a bunch. So I didn't get to witness sure. the glory. But um, here, like on my production colonies last year, I harvested maybe like about a medium per hive, but I split them a ton. So if I had like all drawn comb, I think I could do average, like maybe four supers a hive or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I was talking to another beekeeper though, a few weeks ago and they, they were like, yeah, we do uh, four supers on average without all drawn comb. And I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like that's. And where was he at? Uh, it was, it, it's a girl, but um, oh, she okay. lives in Northeastern or yeah, North northwestern Missouri, I think. Yeah, like that. they the the nectar flows are so much stronger. <laughs> yeah, uh, up there, it's crazy. It's it's just it did it it, it it it's not the most in, you would. It's counterintuitive. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's um, and I think she was talking about how when she makes splits, she hates it because it's always raining, and so that that's probably a good indicator. They get so much rain in April. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, if their flow starts in May, then the plants have a lot of gas left in them, you know, to yeah, really get I going. Mean, and we get these, you know, we don't have those harsh winters, but yeah. we have these brutal summers. I yeah. mean, just brutal. And so we do get this other second shot at the apple, you know, if you will, in the fall. <laughs> but a lot of times it just, you know, um, our, our summer, we're well into summer by the time. July 1st gets here, Ju you know, yeah. mid June, July 1st. And so if things are really tough in terms of a really harsh summer, like basically our winter, our, yeah. our not winter, but our, um, Challenging season. Uh, time, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it could start July 1st and then we don't have anything. And so it, it's just, it's, I, I, and I'm not kept bees up in the North, but um, when you look at the, the, the situations, like I think that our harsh summers are really what kid us in are so much harder. Than, yeah. I mean, beekeepers in Texas, because we're just <laughs> not used to normal winters every year, all of my students like panic <laughs> when the temperatures drop, like yeah. in the forties or whatever, you know? And I always <laughs> tell them like, y'all, we want colder winters. We don't <laughs> want our bees foraging every day especially when we've just come out of like these rough summers and your bees haven't had anything to eat since May, you want them clustered up. You don't want them flying every day, but um, you know, your Texas beekeepers just get so right. I mean, there, we always get calls about like, we should be wrapping our hives and like, that's actually really dangerous in Texas wrap your hives and then the bees are working. You're working against your bees because <laughs> then we'll have an 80 degree day and now their hives are wrapped and they have no ventilation and yeah. have no way to like, cool the hive down when the temperatures are spiking so yeah it's it's funny you said they're getting scared when it gets to 40 in at the beginning of february this year with wind chill in southern maine so we live near the coast so it's relatively moderate it was negative 40 yeah oh, that's insane yeah and up in that's northern insane. parts of maine it was negative 80 wow we had this um so i alluded to the fact that the last two years have been really tough for us yeah. And what happened in um, uh, February 2021 oh, was yeah. that crazy storm when we all lost power for, yeah. you know, we lost power for a week. We lost water for over a week. Um, and that was really hard for beekeepers. And 
I kept having to explain to folks, it's not because the temperatures were so cold that the bees couldn't handle it. I mean, we were at, yeah. you know, below, right at freezing or below, <laughs> yeah. we're close to zero. I guess we were in the teens and below and um, so yeah. definitely below freezing for a week. Plus that wasn't the problem. The problem is yeah. that spring had already sprung. I mean, we had, you already yeah. had all the plants had germinated. Pollen was coming in. You had eight, nine, 10 frames of brood in every colony and all of it because we'd had a really warm winter. And so all of a yeah. sudden it, it would be like for you <laughs> getting like, you know, 20 degrees below freezing in like when's your, you know, your spring usually start like in May, June, um, is that when you come to your spring starts. We like, so our crocuses blooms like beginning of this week and most of our flowers, like our maples bloom in like mid April. Yeah. Yeah, so it would be like you getting these temperatures like at the yeah. end of April for an extended period when everything. And so what yeah. happened was colonies lost, I mean, so much brood. Mm. And as they try yeah. to stretch themselves to keep the brood warm and then and keep the cluster warm. And then it killed yeah. everything. So mm. I don't have to do a lot of pollen substitutions feeding. Pollen is rarely yeah. in limited supply mm. here in Texas. It's the first year, it's the first and only time that I fed all of my production colonies pollen because it killed everything because everything had already germinated and that was kind of it. So we had whole species of plants yeah. that just never bloomed that year because they germinated and then that freeze killed them all and that was it. Yeah, it's late freezes are really the dangerous parts. If you see like all of our bulbs are trying to come up, but we're still getting nights in like 20, 25 to 30. And so you can see the little like frost killed tops of the bulbs because it's so cold. And uh, it, if you look at the forecast, it's supposed to be, you know, 45 in the day, 25 ish at night for the next yeah. 10 plus days. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of slagging along, but at least not everything's going crazy yet. Yeah. It, right. Those <laughs> late freezes are just yeah. like, that's, that's killer. We had this crazy storm um kind of late february yep. and we were all terrified the same thing was going to happen and it, it actually wasn't near as cold but we got yeah. this freak sort of ice storm um and so it rained a ton and then it froze and so yeah. a lot of people lost power because the city of austin was not doing a good job of trimming trees and they were just like falling into mm. power lines left and right um, but actually everything i mean all of our peach trees had budded um mm. All of our mountain laurel had budded, hadn't bloomed yet, but the ice saved everything. You know, in, in <laughs> apple orchards, they actually yep, will yep. like spray the trees down with water before yep. these late freezes. And so the ice protected all of the buds from the cold and then it melted and then everything bloomed and it was hmm. just fine. And it was just like we got the benefit of having the, the water yep. in the soil. The chemist, my chemistry teacher, I took chemistry last year. I'm, I'm a junior. Um, he said that like in the apple, in the orange groves in Florida, if there's a late freeze, they'll spray all the fruits with a little bit of water Yeah. and the, the ice will freeze on the outside, but it won't freeze inside in the orange. And that, that way the little crop is still good. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Nature's an incredibly, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, a, it's, it's just incredible. <laughs> Unpredictable for sure. And you said the mountain, something about mountain world. What kind of honey does mountain laurel make? Because I've heard beekeepers, there's beekeeper in, in Georgia who says it makes terrible honey. So I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that. So mountain laurel is a species of rhododendron. And yeah. so, you know, I don't know if it's all rhododendrons, but uh, the, uh, the, the, Himal the Himalayan honey that you get the kind of, what do they call it? The, um, mad honey, the I think is what they call it. Mad yeah. honey yeah. is yeah. rhododendron, right? Yeah. And so it's poisonous, um, <laughs> yeah. and, which is the same for mountain laurel. So I actually have a great story, <laughs> uh, related to that. So mountain laurel blue, it's one of the first things that blooms. So, you know, it blooms in February, early March, it bloomed yeah. in February this year. Um, so it blooms too early, for bees to make honey off of it because they're still living hand to mouth. You know what I mean? Like we're yeah, not in our nectar yeah. flow yet. So yeah. bees don't actually make honey off of it. And also it's not a, it's not found in large enough numbers anywhere that they could actually make honey off of it. You know, it's yeah. a landscaping plant. And so it's not like a wildflower um, or like mesquite trees, which you might have, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, one tree will have hundreds and thousands of yeah. things. Yeah. Um, but 
So if they could make honey off of yeah. it and it was a concentrated enough, I mean, it could be poisonous. Yeah. And uh, I had a woman who came out, this was years ago and she yeah. brought um, her family came out for a hive tour and um, she emailed me a few weeks later with the subject line, your honey is poisonous, <laughs> which is like heart stopping. <laughs> Uh, and I got it on a Sunday and I, I have a hard and fast, no working on Sunday rules, but I was like, what? And so I opened this email and she had claimed she'd eaten our honey, like gave her heart palpitations. She went to the doctor and complained and the doctor told her, well, their honey is probably mountain laurel honey and it's poisonous and that's what's wrong with you. And, uh, you know, you work in food you were always very cautious of like, clearly that's not what happened. And I knew that's yeah. not what happened, <laughs> but you want to handle this with very gentle, like yeah. kid gloves. Right. And so I gently explained to her why that was not possible. <laughs> and I had the honey tested to like demonstrate that that's, and the, there's a gentleman in Texas, his name was Dr. Bryant. He's passed since um, from yeah. cancer, but I remember him, him like having a chuckle and being like, there's never been a case of mountain laurel, like poison uh, in honey in Texas for as long as I've been doing this job and I've been doing this yeah. job a long time. But what an irresponsible move by her doctor who one, I know, doesn't yeah, know that's... what he's talking about. And two, <laughs> there's something wrong with this woman. And by telling her that she's eating poisonous honey when he has no authority to do as such means there's something still wrong with this woman. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes a great story now, but it was very terrifying at the time. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, in in it, it becomes a problem in the mountains. So he lives in the north eastern mountains of Georgia. His name is Bob Benny. Um, yeah, yeah, um, and he he's like it just grows here. So even though they have so plants, it's wild. It, it grows wild. So Got it's it. it goes crazy, and like Got he it. he drew out like I think more than a deep on some hives, two deeps of. Uh, of comb on the mountain laurel flow last year huh. and so he like he would taste it uh with his crew and they're like yep i'm gonna be tasting that for the rest of the day <laughs> oh because well, it blooms I, yeah when is it it must bloom later there than it does here much later it was like it uh at least late april maybe even may or june so. And I also wonder if there's different species of mountain laurel, yeah. I believe. I'm not an expert. But it, <laughs> and maybe it's a different species. Because I know the one that blooms here in particular is called Texas mountain laurel. So there's probably yeah. another subspecies. And maybe it's a little bit different. That would make yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. You, you should have seen the look on their face. Oh. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so on the topic of honey flows. So you said you get a spring and a fall flow. When does your spring flow start? <laughs> Yeah, that here in central Texas, you know, it usually is like mid-May, mid-May wow. into mid-June. Uh, it's a lot later than every hobby beekeeper in Texas thinks because we get these such these early springs that things start blooming. So people think that bees yeah. should be making honey in February when again, like the mountain laurel blooms. Yeah. But it, it's just this like trickle of nectar and we don't actually have enough. So yeah. we have these like longer seasons, but really, really, really short nectar yeah. flows. So mid-May is usually when we start to see it here. Um, again, further east of us towards Houston and the coast, they get it sooner. And then in the fall, the fall is a little less predictable. You know, we might not yeah. get it at all, depending on how bad the drought was over the summer. Um, but that's usually, you know, we might see it as early as mid-September if we had a mild <laughs> summer or as late as mid-October, which wow. is, kind of crazy because by <laughs> mid November, like we're closing bees up for winter. And so yeah. it's like, it's like this flash bang of like making honey, pull the honey. Like literally we harvest and winterize at the same time, almost every yeah. fall. Yeah. It, it actually sounds like here. <laughs> Is that how it happens from your, it also is more of like a summer flow. So, so we, we get one starting around early if the day, if it's a really good year, we'll get a dandelion flow in early May. Like last year, we got a dandelion flow. Then it, it's kind of skippy. It takes some breaks, but then we get Japanese honeysuckle. Do you have that down in Texas? Mm -mm. So it's like, it's this extremely invasive plant um, that mm. 
it creates these beautiful white flowers and the bush just takes over the understory, any place where it can get full sun. Mm -hmm. And so the bees love it and it blooms in like late May. And so that really kicks our honey flow off. And then that kind of peters off after about two weeks. And then we hit our main flow, which is bird's foot truffle. It's a legume. And then also dush white clover bloom. Yeah. They bloom about, um, first week of June. And then like generally seven to 10 days after I see them start to bloom, that's when we hit like a heavy nectar flow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then the, the Japanese yeah. honeysuckle, how is that yeah. honey? That's the invasive species you talked about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I honestly, I, less of it gets in our supers. Mm -hmm. If I had to guess it was slightly darker, mm -hmm. but I think our main crops, the other stuff. So I'm not entirely sure, but mm -hmm. like I, I took a walk. So my, my parents bought mm -hmm. this property like five years ago. It's 19 acres and we have a brook running through the back and there's lo like kind of lowlands, almost kind of a little bit more wet. And it's just bush after bush after bush of knotweed or not knotweed, sorry, different invasive honeysuckle, yes. like just I'm, everywhere. I'm familiar with knotweed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Knotweed. Oh yeah. We also have that, but not directly at my house. Mostly yeah. we have like a little bit, but the honeysuckle, it's just takes over anywhere in the understory where it can get any sun. Like, we, we destroyed some of it that's closer to our house, but it just made me realize the bees, they're never going to struggle to find more honeysuckle. It's just infinite. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like the Chinese tallow along the coast in Texas. Yeah. That's the invasive I was mentioning yeah. earlier that just, it's so pervasive and there's so much of it. I'm yeah. not a big fan of the honey, but <laughs> really? it feeds bees. Yeah. And it's not my yeah. favorite. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then back with the fall flow. So, us like you, we, you know, maybe a 50, 50 shot, we get a fall flow. It's, I think some places in the Northeast get one, but for me, you know, you're really gambling. <laughs> and it. When, when is that for you? Funnily, it, it starts in early September. Okay. All right. And then uh, it's like, it's like, if it's good, it could be two weeks and they could put on like, theoretically, if it's a strong hive, maybe anywhere between 50 and 150 pounds. Like yeah. it's like, bam. Yeah. And it's just the bees, like if it's a good flow, they can just go crazy for me. Like my first year, I didn't have to feed a drop of sugar syrup in the fall. They filled up two deeps, no issues. That's amazing. And, um, then the next year it was late September and I was like, what's going on? And I was like, okay, well, they're not going to make it through winter if I don't start feeding. So I thought I was screwed, but thankfully I was able to get mm -hmm. enough feed into them. And that kind of made me realize this is not an every year thing, even though it happened my first year. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always tell my students, you know, that uh, if by if by late September, really like mid September, we your bees don't have enough honey, you got to start feeding, and yeah. that's ahead <laughs> of the nectar flow. But if you wait to see if the nectar flow hits, yep. you're, it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. Yep. Absolutely. Same same issue here. I my rule for myself is. I need to be have supers off and be feeding hives, even if we do get a flow by like the 18th or of September. That way I've got like a month to really pound the food to them. And it takes like 60 pounds ish of sugar. So it, yeah, you really have to work it. Here's a comment. Yeah. Um, my neighbor is yeah, yeah. <laughs> about 40 as about 40 big oleander bushes that mm -hmm. bloom beautifully. The oleander is part of the rhododendron family and also toxic. However, it's a false nectar and pollen plant. My bees do not work it at all. That's right. We have oleander too, and they don't touch it. Yeah. But it is supposedly toxic. So if they did, um, <laughs> it would be an issue. They don't. Yeah, they don't. Yeah. They don't touch it. Yeah, we yeah. have oleander too. Any any other plants that you really really like, for as far as nectar production goes? Yeah. So we get um, Texas honey mesquite is beautiful. Yeah. You know, like ranchers i mean texas or the mesquite just gets such a bad rep i get it uh it's annoying <laughs> there's this thought that it like sucks up all the water it, it doesn't yeah. actually it just thrives in drought you know the, yeah the, it needs like hot dry drought weather to bloom mm -hmm. that's when it like does its best work so it blooms in july you know a lot of yeah. years but it makes this like beautiful electric yellow uh honey and it's just like beautiful and then another one that we don't always get enough of to get a single origin but it definitely finds its way into the honey yeah. is the bee balm horse mint um yeah. which has this like beautiful kind of like menti 
on vanilla notes. Um, that one's really, we don't get that one ever. We don't get enough of it in the honey. Yeah. To really like them to single could be a single origin, but uh, that's a good one. And then we have one other um, that we don't always get, but it's from the Texas persimmon tree. So Texas has these native that's trees right. that make these purple fruits, not like an orange persimmon yeah. that you would think of. Like oh, okay. Orange. That's what I was saying. Yeah. 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 Something totally different. Um, and it makes this really black uh, honey. It's really thick and it's really viscose. I've mm. never seen it crystallize. Um, wow. And it's a pain to <laughs> extract because it's so thick. It runs yeah. through the equipment so slow. So we kind of have to let it drain through for 24 hours when it should take, you know, like 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> but that's another oh. really fun one that we get. <clears throat> yeah. And is it also really hard to get out of the frames? Um, it, yes, just because it's so, so thick. Yeah. thick and like sticky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so it, it, it's hard to get it all out of the, you're leaving a lot on the frames when we extract yeah. it. Um, yeah. That's never a good feeling when you pick up the frame and you're like, I just can't run this anymore, but there's still <laughs> some honey in there. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Do you, do you use your refractometer to test it? I'm I just out of curiosity. Have you tested it? Yeah. You know, we don't have to. So historically I have not been really diligent about testing because never really had a need. And then <laughs> yeah. a couple of years ago, we had a really, really, really wet spring. Yeah. And the first batch of honey that we pulled, I tried it and I was like, oh, no, that is <laughs> that is wet honey. Yeah. And so we that year, just because of the high humidity, we had we tested every yeah. batch. And we for the first time ever <laughs> had to buy the, the dehumidifier and do the whole dehumidifier yeah. and the yeah. thing. And so now we're much more diligent about testing. But like I say, except for that yeah. one year, we've never, never really had an issue. Um, closer to the coast in Houston, they have, it's constant. They're always having to like dehumidify their honey. That's a pretty prevalent problem for them, which again, it's crazy. We're only, we're not even a three hours difference in terms of drive time. Um, but that does the climate is so different all over Texas. Sounds like it. I mean, it compare Northern Maine to Southern Maine. Like we get spring like two or three weeks earlier than them. And they get much colder temperatures in the summer because they're away from the coast or much hotter temperatures. The coast moderates us regard. So we're like 20 miles from a beach. Uh -huh. So we're pretty close. So when they're more inland and farther north, they get much hotter summers and much colder winters. So we have the moderating right. effect. Yeah. You know, I've been doing a lot of thinking the last year about how, you know, every People love to say, I'll be keeping as local, I'll be keeping as local. And yeah. I tend to hear a lot of people say that as a way to kind of like push off the fact that like you can't really tell a beekeeper in a different climate how to keep bees, which is yeah. nonsense. You just have to understand how the weather impacts when it. it is. Yeah. And so I have a book coming out next spring um, from UT Press. It's a beekeeping book. And I really wanted this book to be uh, for all people, all places, all climates, yeah. everywhere. So I had to do a lot of thinking about how to teach beekeeping based around, not around a season or a time of year, um, but rather around um, the weather and how that impacts things. So what I decided to do, and I, I it, the yeah. entire book is framed around resource availability because that's what it's all about, right? Uh, of course, the weather affects the resource availability, <laughs> yeah. but like whether or not your bees have pollen, whether or not they have nectar or lack thereof, that is everything that dictates everything that your bees are going to do or not going to do. Uh, so no, I put a lot of time into thinking about that because you absolutely can share beekeeping tips and tricks and learn from one another. You just have to be cognizant of how the climate patterns are different from the beekeeper mm -hmm. that you're speaking with. Yeah, it's it's it, beekeeping is local. Like it's nice to have a local mentor because they know your season. That doesn't sure. mean that doesn't mean that you uh that someone's management from somewhere else like I don't I mean I watch some beekeepers from the northeast, but the vast majority of them don't live there and yet I've learned so much from them. Like beekeeping management is 
can be, you can learn a lot from other beekeepers management, even if they have nothing in common climate wise or season wise mm -hmm. as you, you just adjust yeah. the amount of weeks and your nectar sources. Like it's exactly, it applies everywhere. Yeah. Bees are always going to respond. Honeybees are always yeah. respond the same to the bounty or lack thereof of yeah. resources. It's just understanding the local connection is important because that helps yeah. you understand typically when are those resources going to be available. But, you know, with climate change, be damned, like who knows anymore <laughs> of what's normal and what's not. I mean, look at what's happening to California. I know so many beekeepers that have their bees on almonds and yeah. they're still in California. They like, can't get them out. Yeah. And it's, they've, um, some places in the Sierra Nevada mountains, um, I believe they have like over 12 feet or 20 feet of snow uh, on the ground. Um, the, it's been so intense. And then in the lower parts of the mountains, they've had insane flash floods and record rainfall. Like if you, this, I saw a satellite picture of California last fall and then this spring and one's completely bone dry and brown and the other one's completely green. They've gotten that much rain this spring. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, um, by the way, someone asked where I'm from and yeah. I am, I live in Austin. I'm originally from West Texas, but I live in Austin, which is central Texas. Um, yeah, the whole erratic weather patterns are just, I mean, every year it feels like every year we've got some new record setting <laughs> ice storm or drought or every year there's a whole new weather story for the books that I get to share with new <laughs> beekeepers. And I always yeah. tell my students like, man, I do not know how many more years I can, I'm in for this. <laughs> like it is so stressful. I think I've reached at some point I've reached just some, I've reached a level of just like acceptance of that. It's <laughs> yeah. going to be in crazy and you, you just have to expect that. Um, but that is also why we yeah. lean real hard into agritourism because <laughs> yeah, less dependent. I mean, clearly I can't put people on a beehive if it's too cold or rainy or whatever, but yeah. there's so many other experiences that we could do that are not dependent on weather and not dependent on weather patterns to cooperate in a way that is actually going to allow us to produce enough honey to like pay our rent, you know? Yeah. It's Bob talks about like, he he's like, I sell bees because that's what pays the bills. That's what pays off the loans. He's like, it, yeah. I may get a lot of honey. I may not, but you know what? One thing I can do every year, it's sell bees. <laughs> Absolutely. Because if those bees aren't, you know, you could feed them, you could feed bees to produce more bees. You can't yeah. feed bees to produce more honey. Which <laughs> yeah. is why no beekeepers do honey in the United States. Like it's really yeah. hard. It's really, really, really hard. Um, and you know, you can either make bees or you can make honey. Um, yeah. For me, I am, if, if tomorrow someone was like, you have to shake packages, make nukes, rear queens. Like that's what you have to do. I would be like, see ya. I am out. <laughs> I have zero interest. Why is in that? Very... I'm curious. I, I did. So my first job uh, before I started two hives yeah. in beekeeping, I worked for a bee breeder. I worked for bee weaver yeah. in East Texas. And so we shook packages and made nukes. And like, it was really interesting to learn, to see how, yeah. um, that works. I learned a lot. It's just, that doesn't excite me and get me out of bed every day. What yeah. I love is teaching, is connecting, is talking to people, is like see new beekeepers grow. So we do sell bees, but they're not, we, we just distribute for a breeder that yeah. we love and we know they do great bees, you know? So we offer that service, but I let somebody else do it. It's just like, I hate working with beeswax. <laughs> I yeah. hate pouring candles. I don't mind doing balms and things like that. Cause you mix it with oil and then it's a little bit easier to work with. But yeah. like, I just decided several years ago, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> so I've got a lovely lady about an hour outside of Austin that makes beautiful yeah. candles and I'll let her do the candles <laughs> and then I'll just sell them. So no bee breeding for me. That is not, I'm not in for it. <laughs> yeah. You, you still make your own splits though, right? to replace your own losses. Oh and, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 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 For sure. For yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 We still like do a road that we need to do to manage our own bees. Um, yeah. but obviously those splits we keep in our own yards to, with, with the goal of producing honey. So can you make a split around now and make honey from it in May? Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the main difference yeah. in the South is 
the buildup portion of the year is so much longer than in the North. Yes. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So we, you know, it depends on how cold the winter was this year. We had a pretty warm winter yeah. um, and Paul started coming in real early. So we saw build up pretty darn soon. So yeah. by the last week of February, I was already making splits. So um, plenty of time for a colony split in February by the time May gets here. I mean, yeah, more than sure. time. Yeah. But then also, I mean, for us, uh, because we do honey, you know, if here's your swarming line, I want my yeah. colony to be like right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that nectar flow. And so we could, even if we have to make a split, let's say in, you know, late April, which is not yeah. ideal if our nectar flows two weeks away, well, we can make, take a little bit from a lot of colonies. Yeah enough to keep them out of the swarming line um or also if we do have to make a, a pool heavier yeah. for one colony and we're worried about it not being strong enough we still because we had this long beard up period we can pull yeah. resources from other colonies all the way mm, to get this yeah. colony stronger so so like all of your splits you plan to make honey off them like that's that's how you manage them yes that is wow. that is the goal yeah <laughs> and so when we're making splits like as opposed to making like a nuke, I'll pull three or four times what you would usually find in a nuke from yeah. multiple colonies and make, I'd rather have one crazy strong split than yeah. like two or three nukes. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind of what we do was we, it particularly as we get closer to May, try to like make these much, much, much stronger splits um, so that they're primed for making honey. Yeah. So how do you, how do you do the splits and do you make your own queens? I'm assuming no from your answer before. <laughs> you would think that I would at least do that. And I, we like dipped our toe into it one year. I mean, I know how I, I did it for, I did it yeah. for Bee Weaver. Um, but no, so we don't wear our own queen, but we do let all of our queens requeen themselves, which people are kind of surprised to hear given that we're in the part of the world that we're in. Um, had great success with that. Um, yeah. So I, it's actually funny. Uh, this past Saturday, I taught my students, my apprentices, you know, a split making class and I show them like yep. all of these methods, you know, there's a thousand different ways and everyone has <laughs> like a yep. cute, a cute, funny <laughs> name. And, yeah. uh, you know, and then I'm like, we'll go in the B yard and I'll show you what I really do, <laughs> which is like, I throw a few nuke boxes or like bottom boards out in the yard with like, yeah high bodies on top and I go through and I'm just pulling resources. And as long as I make sure everyone ends up with, because we're usually pulling from multiple colonies. Yeah. You know, like if I'm going to make a split from one colony because it's strong enough and I need to do that, I'm going to take the queen and leave the original colony queenless, right? That's ideal. But because usually I'm pulling from two, three, four, seven, I don't know, 12. <laughs> colonies, yeah. Yeah. I can't take a queen with all those like, different bees yeah. and so yeah um and so yeah i mean i just like throw bottom boards out in the yard or like nuke boxes and i'm just pulling 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 and the first thing that i do is make sure that every box ends up with the frame of eggs because that's yep. the only thing that you must make sure and then it's just kind of haphazard like tossing things around from different <laughs> colonies and stuff like that it's very do chaotic you, do you have any idea of like what percentage of those queens come back from their mating flight it, it's it's clearly going to be like a total like wag because I've never like done the math, but I bet we have over, um, I bet we have over a 70, easy 70% yeah. success requeen rate. Easy. Yeah. Do you use drone flooding yards? No, um, but we don't call for this reason. Really, really mindful. I don't, I don't call much for this reason. No. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I tell my beekeepers like, I mean, and it's, it's important to note that as the business has grown, you know, I used to be in bees four to five days yeah. a week. I try, if I'm in bees two days a week now, we're losing money. So I try yeah. not to be in bees more than one day a week, plus whatever I'm in with students. Yeah. So, you know, this is my messaging that gets passed <laughs> down. Who knows what actually happens in the yards. <laughs> but I always tell my beekeepers, like, if it's excessive call, and then the question is like, well, what's excessive? And I'm always like, I don't know if there's like more than two frames, just start culling them out. Just start cutting them out. <laughs> Dr drum root, you mean? Yeah. yeah. I was, um, I don't know if you've heard of this. It's like 
you put yards around the place you're sending out queens uh, to get more of said queens back since there are more drones. Do you ever concentrate yards for that purpose? Have you done that? No, I, to like, because, um, and I'm sure this is the case for everyone, but you know, we don't, we have, clearly we have some selection of like where our bees are, but it's not like we have yeah. all of the options available to us. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but just for like efficiency sake, we do try to keep, um, you know, if, if, if we have an option to either care for bees for someone that'll pay us or have an option for an apiary in a new area, the yeah. first thing that I do is look to see, are we already in the area and how yeah. do bees do in that area? Um, but no, yeah. I don't do a lot of like very, strategic um kind of drone flooding um mostly just because we were so successful yeah with the way that we've been doing it which is like a <laughs> yeah. little bit more just like haphazard yeah it's... my first two years i remember like buying so many que- i would go queen list and i would like just race to get a queen and then finally at yeah. some point i was like oh i don't have time or money for this anymore and i just like let it go to see what happened and i was like oh <laughs> It's actually real bees know what they're doing. It really works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's if you're not producing Queens then it's not a big deal. Like if I'm, I'm going to send out, I only have, I'll probably have 25 hives and five nukes by the end of the summer, but I'm going to send out over a hundred Queens. And so the difference between me getting 75 Queens and 95 yeah. Queens makes it worth it for me to have those yeah. two drone flooding yards. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. If that's your money maker for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. I mean, Bob says he gets uh, about 15% or no, 10% better mating when he uh, has the drone flooding yards. Yeah. Okay. Was, that's pretty significant. I mean, yeah, I'm surprised it, to hear that. It definitely makes sense if that's, yeah. if queen ruin is the game that you've decided <laughs> yeah. to play in. Yep. I, it, it should be interesting because the idea is to have, uh, three apiaries surrounding it um, on different sides and have about, um, I think it was 10 colonies per 20 mating nukes, roughly, or something like that. And you you want to put it about a half mile to a mile and a half because queens can fly up to five miles, but they're more likely to fly mm-hmm. about a mile. And since mm-hmm. they, they did a study and found that She's only about 15% of queen sperm on average comes from the drones that are actually from her yard to, you know, prevent inbreeding. Hopefully that will up my chances as far as breeding goes and just number of queens that come back from their mating flight. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So you, you briefly touched on this um, when you're talking about splitting. So Saxby's, I don't know if you've seen her online, um, Instagram, she posts all the time about her um, spicy, Africanized bees. Do you have any issues with that? Um, you know, whenever like I get asked this question, it's funny. I was just managing this. <laughs> yeah. My book just came out of peer review. And one of the peer reviewers who does not live in the South, like said that I really should address it. And I was like telling my publisher, I was like, listen, there's more <laughs> info that you need to know. But I'm always really hesitant when we entered this conversation because one you cannot tell if a colony is africanized by looking yeah. at it so like no, yeah. but but now if you're talking about like aggression yeah. it's an important thing to understand but it's also important to understand that aggressive is a super relative term so like yeah. what is aggressive or like unmanageable and un- unworkable to me is something totally yeah. different to a hobbyist right <laughs> yeah my bar is a heck of a lot higher. Um, (laughs) though I will tell you like to get at the, what you're, you're asking and and I'll try to be as not as annoying as it probably feels like I'm going to be, but to get at what you're asking is that I wear very little gear, but I always have gear very close by and very rarely do I have to fully suit up. I mean, very rarely. So, and we let all of our colonies requeen themselves. So, In my personal opinion, <laughs> in my part of Texas, I think the issue is way overblown. Yeah. Way overblown. Now in Southern Texas, I think it's definitely more, it's yeah. definitely more of an issue for sure. <laughs> um, in my part, when a beekeeper comes to me and tells me they have an Africanized colony, I immediately start asking questions. Yeah. Did you light your smoker? Do you feel confident <laughs> in using your smoker? Yeah. Is it 
regular and getting worse over time? Was it one time and it happened just that one time and now you're ready to burn your colony to the ground? (laughs) Um, I mean, I don't mean to diminish the threat, but I do think that it's a very quick, people are always looking for the Mm, quick answer and people, people jump to it really quickly. And I can always only say from my own personal experience of doing this for 10 years and working a lot of bees, I've done this full time (laughs) for eight years is that I don't come across it that often. I can literally think of less than 10 instances, maybe less than five where I would have been like, yeah, I'd put money on that colony having those Eastern lowland African genes, you know what I mean? East yeah. African lowland, I think, is actually the, the some sc- scutellata. I think is the Latin, right? I think it's scutellata. Yeah, you've you've got me beat. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I I was in Malawi just in yeah. November. Uh, wow. and yeah, I saw. I remember seeing that. Yeah, they are they are definitely in that part of the world. That is for sure. The, the, did you see bees there? Like, so uh, it's kind of a crazy story uh we were there uh, teaching uh working with different groups uh, yeah. it was it was a bit of a tourist trip and then a bit of a service trip and we did work with different groups and we went to a school and it's an orphanage school actually and we broke into groups and i had several of my students on the trip and we were running short on time so we broke into groups and i sent a few of my best equipped, most knowledgeable students to go with the kids out in the yard. And I stayed back to teach uh, about um, honey harvesting or something. I don't even remember. Anyway, I didn't, but my students did. So it was a little bit of a tricky situation. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And they should have never opened the hives. I'm not saying my students did anything wrong. I'm saying that the hive should have never been opened. Um, and later we learned, they told us, well, this is why we work the bees at night. And we were like, why did you open the colonies with the kids there? And it was very much like a, yeah, they're here to help. We want (laughs) to do the show for them and do what we think they want to do. Whereas like, we're just here to be safe and like educate. Anyway, it was intense is the word on the street. So, but I was in Morocco (laughs) Yeah. six or seven years ago, also teaching beekeepers and found not, did not find yeah. the same. I don't think that you, I think it's much more common in the Eastern um, kind of central Southeastern part yeah. of Africa, not in the North, which is where Morocco is. Yeah. There are several. Yeah. Um, there are several different, I think, breeds of African bees, especially because it's such yeah. a, I mean, it's, I think the U S is like a third of the size of Africa <laughs> um, yeah. area wise. But uh, yeah. I think there's several different types. And going is, back to yeah. the, the Texas bees, it, it just sounds like you don't have enough Africanized colonies to make that many drones to have any issues. And I frequently find it, people will be like, oh, I have an Africanized colony in the North. And it's like, no, you have a hive that ma- mated with a bunch of mean drones. That's all it is. Like they had genetics yeah. that were more aggressive than your average. It doesn't mean it's Africanized. Right. Like, I think that's right. an interesting. Exactly. Yeah. And like at the end of the day, what we're talking about is like what's important is like whether or not the colony is too aggressive to be yeah. it's unsafe, Workable. right? Yeah. But yeah, it's like a yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> and this is like my publisher is probably like, oh my god, it was like a simple question. Why did she just give me a forty-five minute answer? <laughs> so the jur- the jury is still out on whether or not I have to cover the topic of Africanized bees in the book. But my yeah. argument was that. I can do it, but I'm not going to give you the short, quick three paragraph off to the yeah. side answer that the peer reviewer is looking for, because there's a lot more nuance to it than that. And yeah. I think that's what, well, I, I don't think I know. I know <laughs> yeah. that's what my students and the people that follow me in my community appreciate about me. You know, just yeah. last week, someone was saying, Tara, what I like most about you and the team is that when we ask you a question, You don't just tell us, you actually ask questions of us to learn more about the colony and what's happening instead of just answering. Because so many people are just so quick to, you know, let's say like, I always say, if you ask someone, should I be feeding my bees? And they start answering you, you should stop listening. You should stop listening. (laughs) Yeah, I I made a video about the exact topic of feeding bees, but like there's always caveats. Like I there was a beekeeping presentation at my club by like a local beekeeper and he was talking about feeding your bees. 
And he's like, I feed packages uh, till they get all the comb drawn. But like, I feel like he left out on an important detail, which is I need, you need to be going into your bees to make sure they're not getting plugged out with the syrup or the honey. Like, right. It's, it's good to feed them, but you definitely don't want to be feeding if they're getting plugged out and going to swarm on you. Like yes. it's, there, there's no absolutes. Like you, um, as much as there are good rules and important parts of management that you need to understand when it comes, when it comes down to it, you need to know what's going on inside to really know what you're supposed to be doing. It's not just, Oh yes. <laughs> I get so many emails of people that take a photo of their hive and they want me to tell them what to do. And I'm <laughs> like, I don't know. I can make a very educated guess, but like yeah. you have to inspect your colony yeah. and then you make your decision. You take the information, you take the theoretical I've given you, you take the framework, but then you have to look at your colony to make these decisions. Yep. And like the, the, how much you can help someone when they give you details of like, let's say they don't see much food. There's this many frames of brood, like the, the, the amount of context that, and how much that helps you is astronomical. Like you can't really, I, I took a picture of the bees flying in the entrance. What am I supposed to do? Like, uh, I don't know. You tell me. I mean, you would know more than I would about specifically your hive if you haven't gone into it. Just nobody knows what to do if, unless you get in yeah. there and figure it out. Yeah. I mean, like, it could be getting robbed out. You <laughs> yeah. Know? Like, I don't, I don't even know if the bees come or go in or your own bees if you've not inspected your colony at six months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, uh, there, I, I like, I started mentoring like two people in my fourth year, I think it was. And like, they've always done a really good job. Like they've always inspected the hives and then they'll like text me if they have questions or anything like that. And on occasion I'll come over and inspect with them, but they're always going into their hives. So I have something to base off of my suggestions. Like right. I'm not just, you know, yeah throwing stuff out there. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I teach for a living. You can help a lot, but like yeah. understanding uh, the colony and where you're at in the season and when you expect your, you know, like the question yeah. of like, should I be feeding if it's April 15th <laughs> is a whole different story than yeah. if it's like, you know, November 15th and you have the same amount of honey. Like if it's April 15th, the nectar flow should start any day. Yeah. Maybe yeah. feed a little, but like, I think you're going to be fine. Yeah. You know, if it's October and you have no honey in the hive, like this is an emergency. It's definitely a different decision-making process. Yep. It's, it's, it all depends. You know, that's always the answer. And they're like, well, why can't you give me a straight answer? Because there isn't one. That's the answer. <laughs> no, it's like the never has the, phrase like teach a man how to fish more appropriate yeah. than here yeah. um because I, if i just tell you what you should be doing yeah whether or not i know what's going on in your colony like then you you can't make the informed decision the next time this problem comes up like you need yeah. to understand the whys and the hows so that you can be empowered to make decision moving forward um, that's why, you know, we have this six Saturday apprenticeship program and it's why yeah. I love it so much. Cause I was always getting, I don't even teach the intro classes at two hives anymore because yeah. I just get frustrated because there's so much more they need to learn. And I get, I feel like I'm doing them a disservice because it's a two hour class. Cause that's what it is, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so, uh, Celia, one of our, our teammates here does that. And the apprenticeship allows me with 50 hours of instruction, yeah. we can like get into it and we have all this time together to really learn yeah. uh, and that's why i really appreciate that absolutely it's, it's if you teach someone to understand concepts in beekeeping and be able to understand what they're seeing in the hive you won't be you'll be hearing from them a lot less than if you just tell them what to do even if, yes. if they give you an idea of what their hive looks like if you one of my i would say golden rules would be if you're doing something and you don't know why, then don't do it yet. Yes. It's, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, with feeding in particular, like I always tell people, like, know your why. Please don't just be feeding yeah. because it like feels good. <laughs> I think that's yeah. what a lot of people do because they get very anxious, you know, yeah. because they think of their bees as pets. I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. But they feel like they, they should be doing something. So like, oh, I'll just feed. But there is consequences. Yeah is in feeding overfeeding feeding too much yeah. or feeding when you shouldn't be feeding as you pointed out earlier yeah yeah it's 
uh, some beekeepers on YouTube say context is context is key or context is everything. And that's, that's true no matter where you live. I mean, there are beekeepers from Southern California to Northern Maine, but it it's beekeeping has similar concepts. Like if you, like, I, I, I think if I picked up everything, I moved all my bees to Georgia, would it be a big change? Would I have to learn all the nectar flows? Yes. But if you understand the concepts, you're going to be able to figure it out pretty quickly. Oh yeah. Yeah. Resource availability. It's all it's about. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, well, did you, were you going to say something here? Um, so one closing question I had for you um, is about your apprenticeship program. How does it work? And like, do you have some of the people stay on as staff or I'm just curious about that? Yeah. So uh, just for those that aren't aware, we have this six Saturday apprenticeship program. It is a paid program. Um and I, I kind of based it off of uh, in other farm ag endeavors, yeah. you know, you can like pay to have like an eight week course in like farming or whatever. So I kind of based it off of that. Um, and we're now on our 13th or 14th running. Wow. Um, we've been doing that a long time. So we do two a year. So we've been doing it for seven years. Um, and uh, it's great. We start at the beginning and we go all the way through like, <laughs> a harvest um, yep. and it's one Saturday a month for six months. And so it allows them to see that seasonality of beekeeping. And we do, most people are brand new, but we have lots of people that's come to us two, three, four, five years in. Yeah. And I always have this concern that like making sure those people are going to get enough out of it. But honestly, those yeah. people get more out of it because they're yeah. primed to receive the information, you know, like tomorrow is the second session of the spring group. And we're going to talk about honeybee nutrition and the people will understand it, but there's so much being thrown at them. You kind of need to hear it five or six times. If you've been keeping bees for a couple of years and I teach you about honeybee nutrition, you're, you're just going to hit a lot harder. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, anyway, it's a great program. Um, I have hired, let's see, currently on staff four of my staff were apprentices yeah Yeah. so it's not by design per se it's just like i train them yeah i i know what they know i know them well they know us they like what we do and so yeah my ops person um one of my beekeepers and then two of my hive tour guides are all apprentices and we've hired we hire a lot of that program so it's great we kind of train our own staff (laughs) to get paid to do it (laughs) Wow. So, so the apprenticeship, they, they pay you for it. Mm-hmm. Wow. I didn't know. I thought it was just, oh, okay. That's, that's pretty, yeah. that's pretty sweet. Yeah. Yeah. It's also awesome. <laughs> it's, it's six Saturdays. So like tomorrow, the spring group will come on site. We cap it at 20 usually yeah. sells out. Um, we do it twice a year. And so they'll spend the morning in the classroom learning about honeybee nutrition and feeding bees. We'll probably, we're going to go over installing nukes and packages because a lot of them are going to be getting bees in the next couple of weeks. Um, And then in the afternoon we have lunch. We really uh, prioritize delicious local (laughs) food here. Um, And then in the afternoon we'll go and we'll get in the bee yards together and they'll spend the afternoon in the bee yards. And so, you know, they're getting, if you, even if you've been a beekeeper a couple of years, probably by the end of the second session, definitely by the end of the third, you already have more experience in hives um, because you're getting to see so many more colonies. You know, if you've only got two hives, you only know what happens in those two (laughs) colonies. Your experience is so limited. Limited, Yep. And also, you know, let's say you've learned, you took a class on how to make splits and you want to like make a split, but yeah. If you only got a couple of colonies, like it feels yeah. so nerve wracking. You don't want to like mess it up. Well, I'm like, well, yeah. these are my bees. You can mess them up. Like you can play, you know, like we'll pull out the queen marking kit and they can practice like marking drones and, and, and just, um, it, there's a comfort level of getting to work into somebody else's bees and not feel yeah. like you're going to mess something well, up. Cause we like fix I mean, it and put it back together again. I mean, they're paying you for it to mess up your bees. So I feel like it's fair. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, um, we don't stage anything, meaning like we're going to learn about honeybee nutrition tomorrow and feeding bees. Um, the bees that we go see in the afternoon may or may not need to be fed. I don't know, but there's plenty (laughs) of times that we'll get into a yard, you know, and there'll be a 
I don't know, a colony that's on the verge of swarming. And, yeah. But it's only the second session. We've not talked about swarming yet. Yeah. Well, we're going to learn about it right yeah. here in the bee guard, you know, and I'll pull <laughs> yeah. everybody in. And they, the, the, the practical might get ahead of the theoretical, but yeah. um, that's the beauty of the program that they just get to see so much more than they would otherwise. Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad that we had you on tonight. People can find you. You do have a YouTube channel. I think you have 20,000 on Instagram, right? Two Hives, honey. Yeah, so we're at two hives. Spell out the two. It's not the number two. <laughs> My best advice if you ever want to start a bee business or any business, do not include a number in your business name because forever until the day that you die, you'll say, spell out the two. But yeah, at two hives is the best place to find us um, yeah. on Insta. We have a bunch of online courses. I'm presuming most of your people that view your existing beekeepers, but if anybody is new yeah. and interested in beekeeping, we have some online digital classes for the beginner and those are all on our website and if you're in texas or <laughs> not i mean we have a bunch of people that travel for the apprenticeship program yeah i've had people from georgia north carolina and all over texas so um that uh we do that twice a year on our website you can sign up for the wait list for the fall session now awesome well thanks for coming on i had a yeah. good time talking to you this is great i enjoyed it thank you yep thank you hope you have a good night Thank Bye. you. Bye now.